You're listening to the Business Wealth Impact Podcast, your source for empowering information and cutting edge ideas from the world's top minds. I'm your host, Jean Amlour, founder of Seven Figure Coaching Company, Jean Amlour International. Join me on a journey to unleash your potential and create your highest success. Welcome to Business Wealth Impact. Hello, and welcome to an amazing show. Today, we have a fantastic guest, David Meltzer. He's a legendary sports executive and formerly served as CEO of the renowned Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency, which was an inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. He's one of the world's top entrepreneurs, investors, and business coaches. He's been recognized by Variety Magazine and also was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. He's the executive producer of the Apple TV series Two Minute Drill and Office Hours, and he's produced a lot of other things. He's been featured in Think and Grow Rich and Beyond, which is on Netflix. And his life's mission is to empower over 1 billion individuals to be happy. This simple yet powerful mission has led him on an incredible journey to provide one thing, value. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me, John. It's such an honor to be here. And this is exactly the type of platform that assists me in my mission of empowering others to empower others. And you do such a fine job of empowering people. I felt, why not come on and share our mission together to help people? It's a beautiful thing. And I'm so thrilled to have you here. So the main question, and we'll get into a little bit of how you got there later, but I think really what I want to hear is like, what's your idea and why a billion and how are you going to help a billion? And, and what's all that about? It's actually over a billion people. I always tell people, don't limit me. And uh, my quest and with what I do is to help people understand two different time zones. One, man-made time uh, and all the constructs that are evolving and revolving around man-made constructive time. Uh, and then also the infinite divine time. And I find that most people have a difficult time with that reconciliation of how do I live my day with the pragmatic practices and values and real realities and circumstances of the day within a trajectory, a divine direction, a divine time zone that has divine detours. And so for me, understanding how am I going to empower over a billion individuals to be happy is first to find happiness. So for me, in my skills, with my knowledge and my desire, I found three things to be uh, dependent variables of people that are happy. One, they live in abundance. Uh, usually, uh, they make a lot of money, but they definitely live in abundance, whatever that a lot of money means. Two, they help a lot of people. And three, they have a lot of fun doing it. And so uh, I have gone through a journey of divine direction and divine detours and divine time to make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. And now I'm empowering a thousand people like you that I know in your life can empower a thousand people to empower a thousand, a thousand times a thousand is a million, a million times a thousand is a billion. And if I can create this transitive property of joy uh, to over a billion people, that would be a collective consciousness that uh, would actually change the world. It would change the perception of the world, the energy of the world, and the circumstances of the world. And so my mission is to find a thousand people like you and to share my content, to do good deeds, to give a framework of values, practices, and an execution model that will help facilitate abundance to live in that world of more than enough of everything for everyone. Okay, amazing. So you, you said magic words, you have an execution model. So you have like a, a guideline or a, like a training materials on, on how to get there? Yeah, so I've written eight books. In fact, my first book, I'd love to offer to everyone in your community. I will sign it, send it, pay for shipping and the book. Uh, so I would be happy if anyone emails me directly. My email's right there, david at dmelter.com to share that to you and giving key elements and principles and an execution model to go from the nothingness that most people live in. They, they live like tubes, food in and food out, uh, and teach them how to know what they want uh, each day according to the circumstances of the day, the reality of the day, interest rates, in-laws, weather, all the different circumstances in the pragmatic world. But to look and seek and align the void shortages and obstacles, the lessons of the past, the defining moments of the past, 
with the divine direction of where we want to be or better. And if we can teach people to know what they want personally, experientially, giving and receiving wise, we then can take a nothingness that most people live in and make it a possibility. It's actually a a real mathematical difference in life, a possibility to nothingness. And then if we can teach them to find who they can help and who can help them, we take that possibility and we make it a probability. And then understanding the constructs of time and activities and the aggregation, acceleration, and compounding of exponential outcomes that exist within energy, we can teach them how to do it, which takes the possibility to a probability, makes your probability your perspective, And now it's a matter of teaching prioritization to execute on your now and your next. When we learn to prioritize what's important to us by knowing the what, the who, and the how, we now have the antidote to the resistance. We have the antidote to the uh, prognosis and the, uh, the overwhelmed feeling and procrastination that exists, and it becomes our reality. If you know your now and you do it now, it becomes real. So I take people from nothingness, the possibility with the what, the probability with the who, perspective with the how, and then make it a reality with the now. And therefore, instead of searching for a why, the purpose itself is greater than the pain. You're simply applying the why to what's important to you each day in a divine direction and divine time. Now all the detours in life, your purpose is greater than the detour. Your purpose is greater than the pain. And we are living inspired in spirit instead of interfering with our potential. Mm, Wow, that was so deep. So, and and you said the key word purpose. If people have no purpose, there is no raison d'être, as we say in French. There's no reason to even be because then we're just eating out and that's no way to really live. That's like people that are really dead when they're alive, right? Which is most people, (laughs) unfortunately. Unfortunately, zero judgment. We've been socialized that way. Um, And I like what you said about it depends on the day. I mean, it depends on whether it's a weekend and whether you're sick or not, or whether you have visitors or not, right? And where you are, your vacation or not. So what's fascinating, first of all, what's the first thing that people can do to get towards this kind of a life? What's the one first step? I would seek mentorship of what's most important to you. For me, it was sleep. Mm. Uh, I am a very pragmatic spiritual soul. That's why you can see the ferocious Buddha uh, is the reconciliation. And so I saw that a third of my life is spent sleeping. Mm -hmm. And sleeping had such great impact on two areas that were essential to success, fulfillment, passion, purpose, and even profitability. And that was recovery. Mm -hmm. So if I could recover better, Mm Uh, then I would have a distinct advantage in that goal of acceleration, aggregation, and compounding of outcomes exponentially. But more importantly, it allowed me to access information of a higher source. Um, And so sleep is actually the ability to get out of our own way and work within a subconscious and unconscious, a quantum uh, state of mind, which can facilitate receiving information that can be utilized in the divine, Mm. in the infinite, not necessarily. Uh, in the pragmatic, but to understand at a higher level that divine detour in in divine direction in which you're on. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, sleep was the number one thing, but it doesn't have to be for you or anybody else. Mm. All I suggest is pick and choose what's most important to me. Sleep was most important because it's eight hours a day on average. Mm -hmm. It's a third of my life. Mm -hmm. It impacts my health, which is my number one Mm non-negotiable because if I'm not healthy, then I don't get any wishes. If you're unhealthy, if you're unhealthy, you get one wish. If you're healthy, you get as many wishes Mm -hmm. and you can do whatever you want. So it impacted so much of my life, but other people may pick other things, but the key is find someone that sits in the situation you want to be in, Mm -hmm. ask them for directions. That's the fastest and easiest way to get to where you want to be. That's where I would start. Right. Right. Now, sleep is important for everybody. There are just so, so many studies on this that people used to say, oh, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Well, no, you'll die. I used to say that. (laughs) I knew you did. I figured that. I thought he's one of these I'll sleep when I'm dead types, right? Yeah. Well, now we realize if you don't sleep well, you're ruining your whole life because it is damaging brain cells. You're fog. They're going to be dead. (laughs) I've always needed sleep. And I'm the type that if I don't get sleep even one night, I'm just it's, it's hard. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm dragging. So luckily I've had that. It's kind of been a gift because I've always had to prioritize my sleep from the get-go because I just don't feel right. So that's good. You've decided that. I have a question. I'm curious. Do you like the Silva method while you're sleeping? 
So it's interesting. So I have a sleep mentor, a coach. I've had her for 17 and a half years. Mm. And so I've tried many different methodologies, but I've really created an unwinding routine now after 17 mm. years. Um, and so the unwinding routine, I know the temperature, no negative energy, no negative thoughts, no blue lights, mm -hmm. uh, a certain type of pillow and weight that is specific to me, mm -hmm. mattress, um, mm -hmm. I spend more money on my bed than I do my car. You know, we're similar. <laughs> and and uh, it's it's a great piece of advice, by the way, yeah. to find uh, help. But uh, I travel 200 days a year. I speak in you know, over 200 different cities, states, and countries. And so for me to know when to eat, mm. the appropriate positions, mm -hmm. uh, I have also uh, been tested multiple times. Uh, on sleep apnea. Mm. I use a sleep Nora, mm -hmm. which is a mechanism that will pick up if I snore mm. and lift my head slightly and put it back down wow. uh, without waking me mm -hmm. just to make sure because I don't have sleep apnea, but snoring is not the most healthy thing for you or your marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a happy wife, uh, a well-rested wife is one of my goals of sleeping as well. Right. I've been married for 27 years and I want to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more rested my wife is, the happier my life is. Mm -hmm. And so it's not only my sleep, it's hers that's involved in my sleep routine. Yep. But I always tease people that my, because I'm a very active person with high energy. I tease people. I said, my tomorrow starts tonight. Mm -hmm. So I have an unwinding routine that puts me in a position mentally, spiritually, and emotionally to recover and access information to utilize to plateau and grow every day. Very good. Because some people, they're just like, they're feeding in their sleep and they're not, I didn't used to prioritize. I just knew I had to get sleep. That's all. That's great. Yeah. No, I, I was such a sleep advocate before they started coaching on sleep. I'm like, but if people don't sleep, how can you function? You're just tired all the time. Well, how about people go to bed at night and wake up more tired in the morning? That's like if you and I went out to eat yes. for two and a half hours, even not eight hours, mm. but if we just went to eat for two and a half hours, we both walked out of the restaurant and said, aren't you hungry? We would think something was severely wrong with us, but they don't think that was sleep. No, but I think we've been poorly educated about sleep. That's what I think. Poorly, poorly educated about sleep. Okay. Well, that's amazing. What time? Do, I'm just curious. What time do you get to bed? So 9 p.m. Okay. Uh, in, in the West Coast. So yes. midnight on the East Coast. I fudge a little bit and make it one o'clock into London. Mm -hmm. Asia, we have a whole different routine. Mm -hmm. um, but I mainly live on East Coast time, which would be midnight until 7 a.m. East Coast time. I do live on the West Coast, so uh, I am up at 4 a.m. And seven hours is my optimal amount of sleep because I get to REM and deep sleep so quickly and it's uninterrupted sleep. Uh, and so I am well rested, recovered, and I access information. But that's also why I meditate uh, first thing in the morning is through 17 years of meditation quantum healing and data meditation, I transcend the information I receive while I sleep into my day via wow. meditation. Okay. So you are doing something that's not Silva, but you've been meditating for 17 years. Okay. So you're getting in that state. Awesome. Now, when did you get into all this? Cause you were a sports guy. It's kind of unlikely and you're the joy and the expansion. I'm into all that. And I'm like, wow, because you started off like a Jerry Maguire type, right? Yeah, a scarce mofo, uh, uh, everything. I grew up first in a very, very scarce world. I call it the world of not enough. Mm. All I wanted to be was rich because I had this amazing mom and amazing siblings and amazing family, amazing health. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that was wrong in my life was I was poor. So mm. all the stress was around finance. So as a five-year-old whose father left, mm -hmm. I thought the only thing I needed to be happy happier than I was, was money. Mm. And so everything was about my entire existence and identity was about making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt like a victim because I didn't have money. Mm. And I thought the world was punishing me and everything was happening to me. And I fought it. Mm. I made a, my first million dollars, nine months out of law school in the internet. Mm -hmm. We exited three years later for 3.4 billion. I wow. eventually became uh uh, the CEO of Samsung's first data device division in 1999. Mm -hmm. So I was always ahead in technology. And then Lee Steinberg uh, hired me to be the CEO of the most notable sports agency in the world because I had a venture, a legal background, but a venture capital and technology background. And he saw the future of sports and venture and technology. Mm. So I lived the majority of my life either as a victim in the world of not enough 
or worse in the world of just enough for me, mm. trading, negotiating, mm-hmm. buying things I didn't need to impress people I didn't like. Mm-hmm. And I was blessed with everything I ever dreamed of. I married my dream girl from the fourth grade. Oh. I had my dream house, my dream car. I had my dream family with three daughters that were gorgeous, healthy, smart, wonderful women. I had everything, but I was empty because mm. my identity was stuck in my bank account. Wow. If my ba- I was worth over $100 million. And if my bank account went down 100, I was bummed. I felt like the biggest loser. And if it went mm. up $100, I was the winner of the day. And so uh, through the people who love me, mainly my mom, who I hated at the time, <laughs> because she told me the truth. Mm-hmm. My dad, mm-hmm. who I hated at the time, because he told me the truth. Mm-hmm. My best friend, mm-hmm. who I hated at the time, because he told me the truth. And now finally, the last straw was my wife who told me she was leaving me Mm. because she told me the truth Mm -hmm. and told me to take stock in who I was Mm -hmm. and who I wanted to be or I was going to end up dead. Wow. And I woke up that next morning when her bags were packed after lying, cheating, manipulating, overselling and back end selling everyone in my life, Mm -hmm. realizing that I didn't hate my mom, mm-hmm. I didn't hate my dad, I didn't hate my best friend, and I certainly didn't hate my dream girl. Mm. I hated myself. Mm. And that's when I started to take stock in the values of who I was and what I wanted to become and started to open my mind, my heart, and my hands to things that were different, mm. that weren't scarce. And so I sought the wisdom of the people uh, who I admired and then sought faith that there was something bigger than me mm-hmm. that loved me more than my mom. In fact, I remember the day I ended up losing all my money, over $100 million and going bankrupt. I remember the day I had to go tell my mom that I was bankrupt. Mm-hmm. But worse, the only reason I wanted to be rich was to buy my mom a house. Aww. And I had to go tell her that I did not take my name off of her title and that I lost her house in my bankruptcy mm-hmm. and that she had to move. Mm. I told her at the time that I was punished. I told her I couldn't believe why this was happening to me. Mm -hmm. I've always done the right thing. Mm. I was a good person. I gave millions of dollars away to charity. Mm -hmm. I did everything she asked me to do. Why was this happening to me? There is no God. Mm. My mom said, and I get choked up thinking about it. She said, son, you believe in God. You just believe in the wrong God. Mm. And... Without blinking, she didn't care I lost her house. She was only concerned about me and my well-being. Mm. And I decided that I was going to practice getting into a divine direction with divine detours along the way and divine time to get to where I wanted to be or better by knowing what I wanted, Mm. not what other people wanted, not what was missing, not what I didn't have, but what I wanted, who I could help and who could help me and how best every day. I could do my best, learn lessons, have fun, and prioritize every single day Mm. that way to apply my why. Mm. Instead of searching for more health, more wealth, more worthy, more and more happiness, I started my day and I still do. I am. Mm. I am happy. Mm. I am healthy. I am wealthy. I am worthy. I just got to figure out what I'm doing to interfere with it. Mm. And uh, wisdom and faith has shortened the distance of resistance in my life. And I'm on a mission to help other people shorten that that distance as well. That is just a beautiful story, really. The redemption that you lost everything. Your mom's like, wrong God. You're like, yeah, that you could do it, that you were willing and open. Some people just hit rock bottom and stay there. So, and the fact is, it sounds like you had everything, like really. (laughs) You know, I do now. Family. I, I do now. I almost had everything. Right. I, I didn't have faith. You had everything <laughs> that people check boxes off is what I mean. Yeah. But you had an inner emptiness that and that was the problem. It's interesting. I've, I've spoken to a lot of people that lost everything. And it's almost like they had to purge to start from. Do you feel like you had to purge to get back wow. to the naked canvas to then paint the real painting of your life? Yeah. You know, I had an interesting bankruptcy because... I actually had more money than I owed, but I was so done. Mm -hmm. I just put it all that I wanted to to purge. I wanted to start Mm -hmm. over. And and one of the things that saved me, my my wife, I have this extraordinary dream girl. There's no accident. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I 
known her since the fourth grade. I had my best friend ask her to go study for me in sixth grade camp, and she <laughs> said no. I threw an egg at her, rocks at her, called her ugly. And it wasn't until her mom passed away. And three years after she passed away, she pushed her mom, who was dead, I know, pushed me <laughs> in a crowded bar in Mexico right into her. Mm-hmm. After telling her before she died, she should marry someone like me. Oh, and, and she hated me at the time. <laughs> Made her not have somebody marry somebody. You say, go marry that person. They're going to be like, no, I don't want your advice. <laughs> exactly. So she, she, she literally, uh, when she moved into my home, she said, I said, what's the matter? She said, if somebody would have told me when I was 12 that I'd be head over heels in love with you, mm-hmm. I think I would have killed myself. <laughs> uh, and she was honest. Life but, is funny. Listen to what my wife did. Yeah, and this is important. So when I told her, please don't leave me. Mm-hmm. I will work on changing. Mm-hmm. She said, that's all I ask. She said, I know you're not going to change overnight. Mm. So all I need to see is your effort and progress. Mm. Because I know that if she would have told me, hey, I'll give you one more chance. Mm-hmm. I would have drank again. Mm-hmm. I would have used drugs again. Mm-hmm. I would have lied again. Mm-hmm. I, I would have done something and she would have left me. Mm-hmm. But instead. She was so wise and loved me so much that she said, look, I just need you to put a real effort into this Mm -hmm. because I trust you that you can, if you put your mind to it, you can change. Mm -hmm. But I know you're not going to change overnight. Nobody does. (laughs) Yeah. And that saved my marriage. It saved my life to have that realization that this person loves me so much that she's going to help me get to my best self. Right. Because the ultimatum thing is like, It's like a lottery ticket. Boom, you lost, right? Yeah. You lost. So this was, okay, just so I see effort and real intention, I think it's the intention part. The intention part, if we see somebody has the intention and you slip up, okay, that's okay. We slip up. But if they truly intend and they mess up a little, well, their intention was pure. That She could see you were trying. So I'm fascinated by timeline now. Okay, I know you're into timeline oneness like me, but let's look at real time here, okay? Man made time. <laughs> How long did it take you from that day? And by the way, you hadn't lost your money but when, when she said she was going to leave you, right? That was later. Right, two years after. It was mm-hmm. two years after. So while you were being enlightened or becoming more enlightened, how long did it take you for you to get to the point where you and she felt like, okay, you know, you've really turned over your new leaf now. How long did that take you? <laughs> I would say still working on it, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think we we reached a point about two years after bankruptcy, so four years after mm-hmm. she was going to leave me, mm-hmm. that I turned the corner okay. where she started bragging about me again, mm-hmm. being a great husband oh. and a great father mm-hmm. uh, behind my back. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you that I work hard at it and I have the best marriage that I could ever imagine for me. She's the perfect person for me. Mm -hmm. I'm more, I'm 56 years old. She's nine months younger than I, but looks 20 years younger. Uh, But she's absolutely, I get choked up, everything. That is so edifying to hear somebody speak so highly of their spouse, because it's not common. I am so happy for you that you have such a special relationship, because that's hard. My parents were married for forever, you know, till they died. So that was well over 50 years. And they had this a similar kind of marriage to yours, like a good marriage. So I'm I'm always edified to to see that. And I love that you're like, you know, getting choked up about the wife that you've been married to for 27 years. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So then you turned a corner. Okay. Yeah. And but how did you lose the money? Did you subconsciously say, I'm just gonna lose this? Is that kind of what, what really happened? No, I just didn't ask for help. I was huh. ignorant and arrogant. You know, I my favorite quote is really simple. You're either humble or you're about to be. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I remind, you know, I have great successes in my life now. Mm-hmm. I get a lot of attention mm-hmm. uh, in person, on the phone, email, social media, live stages. You know, I just yesterday got back. It was Damon John, me, Kevin O'Leary, Lance Armstrong, Tim Story, mm. thousands of people in Houston. And I walk off stage every time when there's those 10% of the people that love you no matter what. And they're going to tell you, you're better than you really are. Mm-hmm. I, in my head, I remind myself, David, you're either humble, or you're about to be, mm-hmm. and you can get better. Mm-hmm. And you know, you're here to help other people, mm-hmm. not to feel good about Your whatever stuff. it is you think. Yeah. yeah. And so, 
it, it's a great journey that uh, I live in humility. I, I live with wisdom and faith. That's mm-hmm. I seek it. All the practices I have are to seek wisdom from others and ask for help. Mm-hmm. Um, and I learned some great lessons. All I had to do was ask someone uh, that understood finance, mm-hmm. you know, what it is you do with a hundred million dollars and knowing my timing and like real, because Bob Proctor became my mentor after I lost everything. Uh. And I always say, Bob Proctor, I said, whatever it is you cost, I promise you that it'll be way less expensive than the dummy tax that I've paid. And I said, I've listened to you. I just need you to mentor me. Mm. And he ended up mentoring me and helping me get into a place where I make more money than I ever had, help more people and have more fun. Mm -hmm. And I, he also ironically was the, and still is Proctor Gallagher, the, the biggest donor and the chairman of Unstoppable Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and talk about, I paid him to mentor me and he has given millions of dollars to my charity. Wow. He has made me millions of dollars in my life. And he passed away a couple of years yes. ago. Um, but Jack Canfield, Bob Proctor, Blaine Bartlett, Mary Morrissey, Cynthia Kersey, uh, Deepak Chopra, Saad Guru, Guru Dev, uh, all of these mentors, Joe Dispenza, mm-hmm. uh, I sought out the wisdom from the people that I wanted to be like. Mm-hmm. Wayne Dyer, if you remember, Dr. Wayne Dyer. Yes, he was amazing. Yeah, all those people. Yes. I was big, big, aggressive sports agent like, mm-hmm. but it wasn't for negotiation. It was for asking. Right. And here's what I've learned. You give more, you're given more. Mm-hmm. You receive more. And with faith, there's more than enough. You ask for more than more. Then you can give more than more. You're given more than more. You can receive more than more and you ask for more than more. Mm -hmm. So instead of giving more and receiving less, because either you're not aware of the options and opportunities with gratitude and forgiveness, Mm -hmm. or you don't feel worthy of receiving it, you feel embarrassed about receiving or worse, embarrassed about asking for more. If you give more and receive less, it's a zero sum game you're going to end up with nothing Mm -hmm. and not me. I live in abundance Mm -hmm. and I continually give more. I'm given more. I receive more and I ask for more than more every Mm -hmm. day. You know, I was just on a podcast today and the guy said, you know, what are, what are some things that made you successful? And I said, I always ask the question. I always just ask and ask and ask. And then you're on. And it's also about, you know, asking you shall receive. It's in the Bible. Ask and you shall receive. It doesn't say, you know, don't ask because you're, you're too small and you're not worth it. Ask. And you shall receive. People don't really fully absorb that part of the Bible. You know, like, oh, I don't don't want to ask. I'm like, why don't you want to ask? You don't want to ask for help? That's humble to ask for help. And and in the old days, I never asked for help because I had a problem asking for help. You know, there's people that never ask for help. For sure. And the more you give, the more you're given. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. At one point, one of my, I had gone through something really rock bottom. And one of my friends said, you need to learn to ask for help from people around you or you will die. I thought, you know, she's right. That was the humbling thing. But you also said something about humility. Well, that's ego. I mean, it's just, if people could just let go of their bloody egos, everything would just like lift, right? Because nobody cares. (laughs) Nobody cares whether you're wearing this hat or something else or a t-shirt or what car you drive. Nobody really cares what car you drive. You care, right? I care because I don't want to pay for gas. So I like the Tesla, Um, you know? I just like it. But I think if people, they always say I'm in my head and I'm just thinking, nobody cares about your head except for you. We just see you. We can't go in your head and look in there and pull things out. So that's your own monodrama going on. And I feel like people are so stuck in their egotistical monodrama. They don't think they're full of ego because they're not full of themselves. It's still ego. It's still ego attached to me, what I think and me and me, me, this. I think if they could just like do what you're doing, you live in humility. I'm just asking. And even though they say I'm amazing, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not. It doesn't matter. It's outward. Are you helping other people? And what are they getting from it? I think that's kind of what your message is, right? Absolutely. And the technique that I utilize as we finish up is that, you know, I spent so many years trying to figure out the trauma of my life. Mm. And then, you know, there's millions of lifetimes before this lifetime. There is womb trauma. There's infant trauma, toddler trauma, teenage trauma, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s trauma. And I'm sure there'll be 60s drama, hopefully into the hundreds for me. And what I realize is that my ego is there to protect me from that trauma, that fear. Mm. And it's so vast in the infinite of variables that why not focus in on my reaction to fear? 
Mm. And so I've created a methodology that I look for the clues and the patterns of how I react to fear. Because one thing I learned when I shifted that paradigm was that it's very obvious and instant when you react to fear. When you're worried, you know it. Mm. You don't got to go to therapy to know you're worried. When you're angry, you know it. Mm -hmm. You don't got to go to therapy to say, I'm pissed. That guy just cut me off. And what I've learned to do is to identify the clues and patterns of my reaction to fear and need to be right, offended, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty, resentful, and so on. And instead of resisting it, I just stop. Mm. I breathe through my nose, out through my mouth. I remind myself, I remember myself, and I recollect myself with a source that's bigger than me, omniscient and all powerful in its nature, loves me, protects me, and promotes me more than my mom. Mm -hmm. And then I roll back into the divine direction, mm. the divine time, yes. knowing what I want today, who I can help, who can help me, and how best to get that done and reprioritize again. So I'm maximizing the amount of time that I live in peace and ease. I'm maximizing the amount of time I live in joy. And I'm taking minutes and moments to live in ego, the ego-based consciousness, interfering with my higher self, my potential. And that stop, drop, and roll, I tell people, is really simple. When you're on fire, mentally, physically, and spiritually, just stop, drop, and roll. Mm -hmm. When you're on fire, it's been told to you since you were a kid. That's what I do with my mental, spiritual, and emotional being. And uh John, I appreciate. We got to do this again. I yes. got more shows, yes. more interviews. I apologize. I got no, no, more, more going on, but what a great interview. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you all enjoyed this. Please share this and subscribe and we'll see you on the next one. You're listening to the Business Wealth Impact Podcast, your source for empowering information and cutting edge ideas from the world's top minds. I'm your host, Jean Amlor, founder of Seven Figure Coaching Company, Jean Amlor International. Join me on a journey to unleash your potential and create your highest success. Welcome to Business Wealth Impact.